everyone. Good evening and welcome to RASC Toronto Centre. We're online and I'm Dr. Elena Hyde, the second vice president of the RASC Toronto Centre, and this is our November Speakers Night. So it might be the last uh, presentation of 2021, but don't panic, as they say. Um, we'll be back next year and we have an amazing show for you tonight in the meantime. Just to get ourselves uh, started, I have to say this is actually one of uh, two types of gatherings that we have online these days, not at the Ontario Science Center due to the pandemic. Um, but just as an FYI, our president, Tom Luton, will be talking about our various programs and um, all kinds of things after this event um, at the end. So we'll also be talking about our annual general meeting. But first, we have a little bit of a special event to kick off. And to get us started for that, um, I'd like to actually start off uh, the meeting today by acknowledging that the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, Toronto Centre, meets on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations, including the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and other Anishinaabe peoples. Uh, these lands are part of the Dish with One Spoon Treaty and are now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, Matis, and Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. So as we engage in astronomy here uh, together, we want to respect, learn from, and honor the deep relationship between Indigenous peoples, the sky, and earth. And actually, this is a great way to lead us out into um, uh, this relationship because it's a particular focus of our talk tonight. So very exciting. And for our speaker's uh, talk, we have no other than William Morin. And I am really absolutely pleased to be able to introduce this fantastic speaker. Uh, Will Morin is BFA, BA, BED, MA, PhD, ABD. And if that's not enough letters for you, he's also pretty darn COOL. So just to get you a little bit uh, started, uh, I Again, I'm not going to be able to cover all about this speaker, but Will is an Ojibwe Anishinaabe educator, storyteller, artist, amateur astronomer, and Indigenous knowledge carrier in training. He's a member of the Michipicotin First Nation in Northern Ontario, where he's raising his family. As an active advocate for Indigenous rights and inclusion here in Canada, has had a time as a political influencer, which was perhaps only outdone by his reputation as a multimedia artist and educator teaching Indigenous studies at the University of Sudbury, so over two decades. So if you've been up to Sudbury, you might have uh, seen some of his work there. His artwork has also been exhibited all over, locally, nationally, internationally, and he has lots of degrees, as you could probably tell by all of the letters I read out for you earlier. <laughs> He's actually currently working on an interdisciplinary PhD and as a totally cool extra fact he was the first candidate in 2005 and ran in three federal elections for the first people's national party or I believe it was FPNP of Canada uh, we're not going to talk about that today but it's a pretty cool fun fact so in addition to all of this will also provides workshops and presentations throughout North America and Europe on cultural awareness indigenous culture and he's got a wonderful reputation as an inspired speaker which I think you'll see shortly <laughs> and brings all kinds of knowledge and wisdom to those fortunate enough to hear him. We are, needless to say, very, very lucky to have him here tonight. So I'd just like to finish off with one of my favorite quotes from uh, Douglas Adams, which reminded me a lot of this talk, uh, which is, uh, once you do know what the question actually is, you'll know what the answer means. And uh, so without any further ado or uh, extended introduction, I'll just say, Will, please take it away on this Indigenous perspective with our relationship to the stars. Greetings, so hello everybody. Ani Bojo, Will Morning Dishnikas, Yue Nong Nozut Mangandas, Mangandora Michbagwadan and Donjaba. That uh, language I introduced myself in is the language that my mother spoke, my mother in law, my father in law speak. It's a language that my grandparents on my mother's side spoke. And it's a, it's a, one of the Anishinaabe languages in the land that we are in. So I'm, I'm honored and humbled to be here to share and speak and, and present to you about an Indigenous understanding of how important it is that we need to know which geography we are in. And only then will we better know, understand how the, the Indigenous peoples existed within that land and how they understood that land and how they communicated with that resource that was around in within that geography. So as I as I move into my my presentation and and as we as we articulate the the understanding of how important it is our um, knowledge is as humans that indigenous knowledge is equally as as important it's human knowledge so as i did my introduction will mourn is my income tax name 
my indigenous spirit name is North Facing Wolf. And Wolf is my clan. And the community I come from is called Michipacotan or Michipacuadanong, which is on Lake Superior. And as we understand for indigenous peoples, it's that we as our creation and our creation story is not limited to just here physically on the earth, that for North Americans and for indigenous peoples, for Anishinaabek peoples specifically, our story begins among the stars. And how important it is that those stars are not just simply specks in the skies or, or subject matters within stories. They actually have a relationship to our connection to the time and existence that we've been here. As we understand how we see through the seasons and the changes and standard constellations that most people understand. But the knowledge that is taught about constellations is European knowledge, but we're not in Europe. We're in the Americas. And as we look up at the stars from this geography, we see the stars differently. We did for thousands of years. And as we understand that relationship to where they move and rotate around the, those, those four seasons, we have that understanding that for every culture in every hemisphere, as they look up to the stars and wonder and imagine, and they personify the stars that help define their worldview, to navigate the waters, explain their connection to the broader natural world, it's no different among indigenous peoples. But for indigenous peoples and, and, and the community that I come from, which is, as we see where it says Agua Rock, it's north of that where you see Michipacotan just south of Wawa. That's where my grandparents are from. And the community that they come from um, is, is one of many along Lake Superior that just south where it says Agua is where this pictograph is identified. Pictograph drawn on the rocks uniquely defining that relationship to the spirits, the animals, the water, the world, and the view of the stars from that physical location. And, and I'll speak of this, this being shortly uh, within the, in the presentation. But as I honor my mom, as I honor my mom, my grandmother and my grandfather, as I say, that, that they have a place in where it is and why it is I am who I am. So as I honor my Anishinaabe ancestry, even though I am of mixed ancestry, as I recognize that my indigenous roots is that source of where my inspiration comes from. And the community that my, my grandparents came from, that they were born into, goes back over 7,000 years. That there's as evidence of settlement within that area. And, and that there is 2,000 years older than the cultures and countries of Europe. And so when we understand that, that these ancient cultures that lived in the Americas within these unique variations of geography had an understanding, had a relationship, had a, a, a connection to those diverse geographies. And they would share and visit among each other. But the artwork that they would portray and, and produce wasn't just simply artwork. That these ancient patterns that we saw in the artwork and symbols and, and in their stories and their connections to the natural world, that the key thing here is, is that, that they were related to the spirit world. They were related to the stars above us. And what was really understood, and if we take this as a quote to start us out by James Dumont, one of my mentors at the University of Sudbury who helped form and develop the Department of Indigenous Studies at the University of Sudbury, the second oldest in Canada. He was also um, um, contributing to, for over 45 years, the discipline of Indigenous Studies. And this is an article he wrote about how important it is that in order for us to understand a unique indigenous way of seeing the world, we must be willing to accept that they see the world differently and then participate in that way of seeing. And if we apply that to any culture, that if we talk about European myth or, or Italian myth or, or African myth or, or uh, Zimbabwe myth, we realize that, that it's the same application, that we must recognize that unique way of seeing is special that we need to participate in that way of seeing in order to understand it. And then to get there, we have to participate. So accept it and then participate in that way of seeing. And how important that is, is without that, we would lose sight of that. So I honor all of those teachers that have taught me. That includes my, my mother, Beatrice Morin Ba. Ba, we would say when someone has passed on. And many of these other individuals that are still either with us or that have passed on that continue to teach me in their excitement and their passion of the language because it's through the language that has helped me better understand these stories that go back thousands of years and that relationship within the physical geography here's some of my artwork that echoes some of that relationship that that thunderbird nim kibaneshi that the word th totem pole is actually an ojibwe word not a west coast word 
It's our word that was misused and used in, in Games of Thrones and other things, that there's so much about indigenous culture that has been taken from us without our permission to sell and tell things, but they've never asked us. And so now I invite you to be aware of that, that there's so much out there that we can learn about indigenous peoples when we understand their unique relationship to their geography. So here's the starting point. If you want to understand indigenous peoples, you need to first start their, with their language as that is a connection to the earth. That is a connection to their surroundings. So our four directions, like a compass, like those four seasons that we see in the stars, okay, that they are identified by stars. So Anang or Nong, that word means star. And the word Eastern star or the morning star, because Wabang, Wabanang is star, Wabang is morning. Wabanang is that morning star. Jawanang, that southern star, that southern direction, that warmth of that sun, the southern star. That's what that beginning of that word speaks to. Epingishmok, Gawinang. Epingishmok means when the sun goes down. When the sun goes down, it's hard to see the stars because the sun is so bright. So the Gawi Nung, the Gawi means that there are no, and then the star. But this is the important one. Giwedanung, that north star, doesn't mean north because the root of that word, Giwe, means to go home or going home. So the whole word itself, Giwedanung, means the going home star. And when we sleep, we dream. And when we dream, our spirit travels to the spirit world and visits among the stars. And that's the root of what I'm talking about is, is that in order to understand indigenous peoples, you need to understand their geography and their language within that geography, because it's that language that helps us understand the stars, to understand the environment, the animals, the plants, and so forth. And that's the kind of knowledge that we need today, especially in the era of climate change. Here's a symbol, those that may not be aware of it, it's called the medicine wheel. The medicine wheel is an ancient symbol that have been identified at being over 5,000 years old carbon dated stones located throughout the Americas that echoes a relationship to the changing in the seasons and so forth. But if we look around, how many spokes on that wheel when you see, if you were to count them, and if I were to say, oh, oh, well, look down at the bottom right corner, how many phases in a moon? How many days between a full moon and a full moon? And you will see that same pattern of spokes on that wheel. And that's that relationship. But this is the connector. This is the relationship that those four colors represent not only the seasons, but they also identify the stages of life, child, adolescent, adult, old age. We identify them also as the stages of being. The earth uh, is, is, is where we're connected to, but we have to understand as a physical being, an emotional being, a spiritual being, as well as an intellectual being. But that symbol of those four colors also prophesy something. That five 5,000 years ago, there was a prophecy that all those four colors of humankind will come to live here on Turtle Island. With North America identified as a turtle. And many indigenous tribes have that relationship. And the patterns on a turtle's back, if we look at the, the, the plates, that those larger ones in the body of the shell are 13 large shapes. And that if we look at the outer edge of the shell and we count them, there's a total of 26 smaller shapes plus the head and the tail make 28. And the patterns within that is that there are 13, 28 day cycles in the four seasons. And that the prophecy was that all of those four colors of humankind will come to live here on Turtle Island. And that prophecy has come true if you just look anywhere around any metropolitan city within North America, and you will see every human culture and DNA exists here. But where outside Turtle Island will you find Native Americans? Nowhere. Because that was our prophecy for us to welcome and the return of our brothers of the other colors. And we understand that within our creation story, if we look at those four those four planets and the earth being the third rock from the sun, that we see those four planets that identify where they are in our creation story. We have stories of that, a time when the earth was too cold, when it was too wet, when it was too uh, hot. And then eventually the creator gathered all of those elements and created an earth that was in balance. 
And that is the one that we are on in the fourth world. So these are stories within our creation, within our creation, creative stories, our creation stories throughout the, the Americas. Indigenous peoples recognize that it doesn't begin with what our existence is here on the earth, but our time among the stars. And so when we see that those art forms that were created, whether they picto forms or pictographs or, or petroglyphs, that these were forms that were created not to match the couch, not for decorations designs to be hanging on a rear view mirror, that when they created these designs and this, this, this artwork, it was to hold that knowledge for future generations. They were timeless messages within this artwork that these images that were designed, they were intended to communicate beyond space, beyond that understanding of what you would see of as, as that clinical time, linear time, because for Indigenous peoples, we would have an understanding of both the past and the future simultaneously within the present, and we, were, we would have access to that. So these art forms, and that one that I show you there on the right-hand side is, is Mishapiju, which is painted on the rocks, and, and one of the beings that he lives within the Lake Superior as one of the great spirits that live on the land. So we have our human spirits, and then we have these greater teaching spirits, these larger spirits that can communicate messages. But some of our artwork communicate our relationship to the natural world, to the animals and the plants, to the fish, to the serpents. And these beings teach us and tell us that understanding. So in order to fully understand an indigenous person and to teach indigenous students is that we need to teach them as a whole being. And if we apply that same knowledge to indigenous, to all human beings, that indigenous knowledge is human knowledge. And we apply this to all students of all cultures that we need to teach them as a whole person, their mind, their body, their spirit, and their emotion to better understand them because that's what's key to be a balanced, a balanced healthy being. But in our language, <clears throat> our language being a tool to help us recognize those patterns that we see in nature and among the stars and within that unique geography is that we see that relationship and that language guides us through that. So that 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 relationship within the unique geography within our respective territories on Turtle Island and that language, so our traditions root us to the land, root us to the spirits with the stars and the cosmos. And so that's the key. But the message in all of those teachings is the, the lesson of staying balanced, to live in balance on this sacred land. And so if we understand this again, back to the medicine wheel, how all of those components that are associated within those teachings of a simple circle divided equally into all colors, four colors. And if we recognize that each color is equal, my question to those of of, of academia and institutions and, 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 and governance and, and bureaucracy, which color is our education? Which color is our governing system? Which color is our industry system? And, and that's where the problem lies. We need to open up to understand the geography and the teachings within this geography. And we see that that teaching here is that we need to have more of our brothers and sisters of the other colors included in the decision making within our schools, within our, our hospitals, within our governing systems, within our institutions, then we would have a much more healthier balanced environment. And we would be able to better challenge what is causing that problem called climate change. And so these again, bringing it back to those words for those different directions, Giwedanong for that north doesn't mean North Star, it means the going home star. So as we move through an indigenous constellation, looking at the stars, because if I moved out to the East Coast, I would have a different set of animals. If I moved out to the prairies, I would have a different set of animals. If I moved down to, to California, I would have a different set of animals because those geographies would ask those indigenous peoples to see the constellations in different ways. Because we look at them and we see them in the way we do as humans, as was done in Europe, and creating these forms and beings that anthropomorphize those structures in the Americas and in within the woodlands, the Ojibwe saw these animals. And specifically, we saw a connection between the North and Small Dipper, or I should say the, the, the Big and Small Dipper, that, that those are not just simply stars in a pattern, that they were beings. And here is two of them. One of them is Ojig, which is the Big Dipper, and Mung, which is the Little Dipper. And each of these beings are also 
animals within our clan system among the woodlands. And we have a seven star clan system with subclans within them. And these are two of them. And one of them, the loon in the small dipper, which carries the North Star is one of our leadership clans. And so we see the role that they play within our teachings as we look up to the North Star and we see that that that's that being that is there. What's important is to understand the pattern that is on a loon's back reflects the stars above and how those stories relate to our connection and honoring of that being that 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 bird and how that role that it plays within our clan system guides us and reminds us of our connection to family and to home and community and to the land that we reside on. And so if we were to find a loon that has passed on, um, we would take the carcass of that loon and we would make sure that we would place it on the ground with its back facing up as a way of honoring and respecting the role that it plays, but also the honor it has in the stars above. And we see the, 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 the loon itself as it represents all of those tools and all of those teachings its pattern in our mythology, we see that those stories remind us of how important it is that we not forget where we come from, which is among the stars and within the environment. And we are part of that. We are both of the earth and of the stars. And those beings of that little dipper, um, that, that North Star within that role is a reason for why they are also one of the leadership clans in our clan system, because they guide us. They remind us of where we come from our home, family, and community. And so as we understand that the Ojig, the Big Dipper, in the role that he plays, and a story I will share a bit later, how important it is that they recognize as part of the clan system is that he is one of our warriors. He is one of our protectors in our clan system. And how that role that he plays as the function that he plays within our stories is how important it is that each of these animals has their own story. You know it as the great bear. If I went to the Cree, they see it as a bear. If I go west to the uh, to the to the prairies and to the mountains, they would have a different animal. If I went to the east coast, they would have a different animal. And so we need to know the geography to know the animal, to know the story, to know the constellation. And so the connections here is reminding us of that relationship. So like that pictograph of Mishabiju, Mishabiju or curly tail, the great panther, you know of as Leo, the lion, and that cancer constellation. But for us, Mishabiju is a spirit being that lives within the Great Lakes and travels around and communicates and is, is a messenger of many things. And that time of survival is that what he wrote, what he plays. The connection here is Bijou means lynx. Mishabiju is that great lynx, or as some may refer to is our freshwater dragon. And a being that has that appearance to still have been around during the time of the dinosaurs. And that's the stories that we speak about that many of our people have stories that go back thousands and thousands of years. And these are how they are continuing today, connecting us to the past and to the future, to the cosmos and to our natural world. And so here are two more of the constellations of uh, a Jijok, which is the crane, and you know of uh, as uh, Cygnus, but for us, he, or she is one of the other leadership clans. And the role that, that, that she plays is in guiding us and reminding us of all of those connections. And so as a constellation overhead, that time that we see it in that summertime reminds us of the role that they play and the migration that they play to travel and journey far and reach beyond our boundaries in order to gain appreciation and respect for those that are not who we are, to gain an understanding of other. And that's that connection is that we need to have that both internal and external roles of understanding of our environment. The moose in particular, you know of as Pegasus, and, and we see that moose now, this time of the year. It is hunting season. And the only time we would hunt this animal is when we would see its constellation in the sky. And how important it is that that moose would provide us for that food and that clothing and its, its pelts for its shelter. All of those parts of that deer would be utilized in some manner as a way of respecting that animal when it would give it of its life for us to survive. But we would not hunt that animal in our respect for it in the spring or in the summer or during the winter. Because if we do so, we threaten its survival and we honor that and we are reminded of it. So now the stars become our teachers and reminders of those cycles that come, those patterns that come, those changes that come. 
and how important it is. And so when we are not honoring that environment, that, that geography and the balance of, of that environment, then that environment will respond back to us and we will suffer. We will hunger. We will do without because it's the environment that reminds us how to stay in balance within it. And that's the core of indigenous culture. So we see another symbol within that uh, constellation of the Inishabek within the woodlands and that geography is that it's called the sweat lodge or the, the Dosuan, which is that 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 uh, exhausted bather. So the, those individuals that would go into the sweat lodge and the sweat lodge is a cleansing ritual, sim among, similar among the, 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 the sauna of the, the, the Finns and northern cultures of Europe, that this was similar in that it was it was a, a dome shaped structure that you would go in, hot rocks would be brought in. But there are so many ceremonial teachings and traditions and protocols associated with it. But it's a mimic of when we were inside our mother's womb. And when we are coming full circle and we are preparing to be reborn again, that this tells us when we are to do that cleansing and that rebirthing and that we don't need to be doing it all the time, but we need to do it when we've lost our connection to our mother, which is the earth. And so these are the examples of when we need to prepare for that cleansing and to prepare for that rebirth. And that would be identified. If you see it located within the constellation, it is as it's at the end of spring as we move into summer. And that is when we would prepare for that cleansing, that fasting, and that purifying of the body before we enter into the new food season of summer and fall. And so these are the ways in which our culture had ways of keeping us healthy to survive. So there's that physical that spiritual, that emotional, and that intellectual understanding within one ceremonial ritual of the sweat lodge. And, and we see again, the, the, as I mentioned earlier, but uh, um, um, uh, I, this is a, the wrong image that's in this, in this slide, but it's, it's uh, Nana Bojo is uh, the image that is um, uh, associated with that form is the great hunter. And I'll show, him, I'll show you him uh, in, in, if we took a, take a look at the top corner of the slide that is up there now, is Nana Bojo is a, uh, a great hunter, but he is one culture. Other cultures refer to him as Jajak, or he's just identified as a great hunter. In the Ojibwe and among the woodlands, he is identified as this great hunter or Nana Bojo. In our tradition, in the wintertime, when there is snow on the ground, when all of the spirits are resting, it is their time, their time to rest. And it is only our time to speak of them. Because if we speak of them at any other time of the year, we invite them to come. And if we are just saying their name and we invite them to come and we don't honor them, they will play tricks upon us. And that Nana Bojo is that trickster and the role that he plays and how mischievous he can be. And he comes, he comes at all times of the year, but it's in the winter time when Kibabun Nene, so Babun Kinene is that winter maker, what you know of as Orion in the role that he plays in bringing that change in the season for that winter time to come, that we can take that time to rest, that we can take that time to huddle close together as family and share. And COVID is an example of what has been done to, to many people across the globe that have forced them because of isolations to be closer to family, to be closer to home, to share and to reduce our impact on the environment and, and share our resources and share our stories. So the key here is understanding is that there is truth in the connections to the stars, to the unique stories within those specific geographies. For indigenous peoples, it was just our way of being respectful to the environment we are in. And so we understand the stars, we understand the constellations, we understand the, 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 the mythical beings that are within those constellations, but we need to know the geography that we're in now. Here's some Ojibwe language. And at the end of this, I'm going to give you a test to see if you remember any of these words. I'm just kidding, but you can try to learn. So here is some Ojibwe words. The word for earth in Ojibwe is ki or akki. Look at the rest of these words and what they relate to within the Ojibwe language. The word itself is in the word for color, brown. The color brown is kionde, that color of the earth. To teach, who's our first teacher? Our mother. And who's our first mother? the earth and that is kinomage mother earth is shkakimakwe we look at the word for medicine medicine mishkike 
and that mishk at the beginning of it refers to mishkode, that that um, um, uh, understanding of that fire, the, to understand that word of strength, is that true medicine is that strength from the earth, earth. And if you have two feet standing on the ground and you walk gently on the earth and in a respectful way, you become medicine. And when you are walking on the earth and you are doing it balanced and you look up, then the stars become medicine to you. And that's how we understand the importance of our geography within that environment we are in, is that we need to be respectful of that environment. And there are many more stories associated with it, even the word for turtle, which is Michigan is our clan turtle, but the many different species of freshwater turtles, and one of them is Mackinac, Mackinac, as in there's an island and a bridge near Sioux, Michigan, that is called Mackinac Bridge or Mackinac Island. It literally means Turtle Island. And that's the story of that relationship that this is just one word, ki, a ki, for Earth, relates to so many different concepts that tells us of a relationship on a much bigger level. To understand the geography is to understand the people and their language. Their language helps you understand the relationship to the geography. So here's some more words as we move through the, the, the starting on the roles that we play as, as a question that I've asked many people about those that speak the language. The word kwe has been confused as um, to, to uh, mean woman. So Anishinaabe kwe or Jaganashi kwe, but it doesn't literally mean kwe. It is a, an action. The Ojibwe language is, is a language mostly made of verbs. And the word itself, as honoring my, my friend Doris Wasanoba, as she reminded me that that kwe refers to intake, because the word kwe can also be found in other words that relate to things that take in. When you drink, you take in the water. When you have a feast, you take in the food. When you have a woman who is going to become a mother, she must take in the seed. And that's its power. So when we understand those elements, here's another set of words. The word for heart in Ojibwe, ode. Put your hands on your heart, if you got a heart. If you have a pacemaker, put it on your pacemaker. And I want you to tap it four times, and I want you to say, ode we gun, ode we gun. In our language, that's four beats, and that's the word for drum. Just like those four directions on the medicine wheel, like those four directions in the seasons identified in the locations, of the, of the Big Dipper in the changes in the constellations. And we see that that connection is there because when you hit that drum, when we do a song four times, we beat that drum four times gently at the beginning and at the end because we are honoring all our ancestors, all your ancestors, all human ancestors because we are all brothers and sisters. Now the word for heart is also in the word for fire, shkodeh because that fire would be located at the center in the community, within the home. And that word totem, dodem, has the word heart in it, because that animals are part of our clan system, which are part of our family. And so that we need to keep family close. And so the animals, as our guide and our leaders of our clans, is that it's our human connection to the natural human or natural animal world. On the right hand side, we see this other word, di or ndis. That's a word element within our language that is linked to words that relate to mutual benefit. So, this one particular, ndis, is your umbilical cord. So, when you were inside your mother, you have a connection. When she's eating pickles and ice cream, you're eating pickles and ice cream. And that is always going to be there. If you have been born and you got a belly button, there is a reality. There is some mutual connections that you have between you and your mother. And science and, and, and uh, um, uh, technology is starting to come to understand that that is continuing on long into a woman's um, uh, uh, later years that they still maintain a connection to their children. And it's that understanding is, is that our language that is thousands of years old already knew that. And here is a connection that dip in there refers to that mutual benefit. Because in our language, as we see many of these words, and I'm going to talk to you a story about the umbilical cord and the placenta. So I'll get to that in a, in a few seconds as we relate to our teachings and our traditions in the language. So here is another word element that's in our language, which is j or um, uh, g. So in, in words like root or broom, those are words that make reference to where the trees 
spirit. Jibai means spirit. And that word jibik is the root of that tree. The spirit or the inner effort of that tree is deep within its roots. And so we see all these other words that relate to it. The word yesterday is literally now in spirit form. So jinago. Uh, when we make reference to words like um, um, dream, as I mentioned earlier, bawa jage, bawa jagan, that ba is to sleep, that wa is that 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 light we would see, that j is spirit, and so that when you sleep, your spirit travels to do something, and it visits the ancestor. But the word for baby, benoji, has that spirit element in there. So when a baby comes into the world, it's a physical being with the spirit within. So that connection to the baby, that placenta that a baby has, when the baby comes out, then the placenta, the placenta then is physically buried at the base of a tree among its roots, that jibik. And that placenta has the blood of both mother and child now buried and deeply connected to the earth, that geography. And so that relationship is identified. When you say in our language, Sudbury or Toronto or Ottawa or Guelph or, or, or uh, uh, Nipissing, wherever it is you identify, and in, our, in Ojibwe, we would add the word Indon Jih Ba. And literally, those two components at the end, the Jih is spirit and Ba means to sleep. So when you say where you are from, makes reference to in our language that is a thousand ten thousand year old language that says that i come from a place where my spirit sleeps that spirit is that blood connection that spirit connection to that land and that geography and so our language isn't just simply words they are actually relationships to stories to teachings and to the past and to the universe so we see that connection, we see that energy, we see that, that form. If we look at the way the energy of a tree reaches up and out and the branches being what they are and then the roots down and out, the same shape and pattern that we would see in a tree can be replicated or mimicked in the pattern of the energy field of the magnetic field of the earth. And we see how that, that, that energy is so strong in that wavelength, that is its power and that is its movement. It's is that it's, it connects itself from the core from the heart and radiates out. And so these are ancient words in our language that is more appropriate in defining metaphysics of the universe in the new discoveries by physics and metaphysicists about the universe that in, is already existing within indigenous languages. And so here's another symbol. When we have a dream catcher, and if we look at the pattern of a dream catcher and what is the importance of a dream catcher in our creation story, when, when we talk about um, the coming and going from among the stars, this is a tool that was identified that it was a symbol, a single strand of string weaves into the pattern that is what is a dream catcher. And that pattern is equal to that of a pine cone or the hat of an acorn, but it's also the mathematical formula of five or, or, or that Fibonacci or the golden section. And that symbol that is there is what was used by, by Western cultures and, and, and European cultures in, in the forming of the study of architecture and, and the building of many things. But for us, it was a reminder of our interconnection with the universe and the natural world. And so that, that symbol of the dream catcher wasn't just simply a dream catcher, because it was a symbol like the way a lighthouse is to a ship. The dream catcher is a beacon for the spirit to make it able to return back to the body when it returns from the spirit world that the dream catcher would have the energy of the person who made it gifted it to this person who was traveling from the spirit world their spirit would know the energy and would be able to find its way back to the body and the bad dreams as it catches bad dreams it actually catches that which is not sure or misguided or lost spirits that may not know the energy of that dream catcher and so that we have to understand it's, it's more than just simply a craft that we would hang in the window, that it actually has a symbolic meaning that links us to the natural world. It links us to the journey when we are spirit traveling to the spirit world when we sleep. But also, if we look at the dream catcher and we hold it upwards above us, flat, looking at the stars, 
the Dreamcatcher is also a star chart and that it's designed to help us as we guide our way through the stars. And so just as a quick recap, the, the, those among the woodlands we identify as the woodlands, the trees, the metok oak, the metik, the, the, the plant life, the zokigan, um, and that the earth, the ki, the king, and that, that the, among the woodlands, we would use those trees for our wigwams, and we would use them for our medicines, which is the mishkike, and that nijam for that food. And then all of our connections, that connections that link us to the earth, that is its relationship, that is its connection. It's our connection to that physical geography within the woodlands as Anishinaabek people. And if we move to another geography, they would have a different relationship because the geography would be different. And therefore that relationship would give a unique interpretation of the stars as well. So the cradle board, if you've heard of the word cradle board before as an image, the tick and noggin, the tick means tree and noggin is a carrying container. And so that literally translates it's the tree carrying container, but it was a child's first classroom. And that the child is now bound tight so that even if it can't stand up on its own, this cradle board enables it to stand up as if it were a fully grown human. So that that spirit in that baby is equal to the spirit of an adult. So we don't see the child as less than, we see their spirit as equal. And therefore, it may carry messages. So our job is to care for them and protect them. And so these cradle boards were designed to give them the opportunity so that they could be propped up and be seen as equals among us. And so um, some more words that relate to our language in that wa, as I said to uh, you uh, uh, near the beginning about the different directions and the word for morning, that wa refers to that color of light or white. And these are just some of the words that make reference to those um, um, associative elements and the patterns in the language. And that's just one example of it. So we see so many different elements in the way that wabus, and this is the connection that I want to share with you as we relate it to one of the mythical beings of Nanabojo. Nanabojo is a character, now I speak of him with snow where I reside now, the snow on the ground enables and gives me permission to speak of him. Because if I call his name Nanabush, Nanabush is our hero. He is also our blunderer, our trickster. And that if we say his name and we don't honor him, and a teaching that I receive from within our, our traditions is that if I give the whole history of his name, he won't come. He will know I'm only speaking to teach of him. His name is Nanabojo, Wenabojo, Wabozo, Wabus. Wabus is rabbit because he's a shapeshifter. Nanabush could transform and shapeshift into the form of a rabbit. And that ability to relate to the natural world, learn from among the animals, and transform back to a human to teach us humans how to honor the natural world and the animal beings. So the word for rabbit in our language has in that root word for Nanabush, but also when we greet people, we would say Anin in Ojibwe. But we would also have a second greeting. When we go to ceremony, we would say bojo. Bojo acknowledges winabojo, nanabojo, nanabush. That first human being we honor by saying his name in ceremony that we say to each other that come from that same common ancestor. And so our name and our word and our traveling uh, through this land within the woodlands is an honoring of our relationship to this geography. And so when we say nanabush, we must understand that we need to know the whole story. If we say his name, just the name, one version of his name, Nanabush, when there is no snow on the ground, we invite him to come and play tricks upon us. And so we see other words related in our language and, and so many ways in which the language shows patterns that connect us to this physical geography. Even the word for Sault Ste. Marie in Ojibwe, as in St. Mary's Rapids, as we say it in, in, in French, Sault Ste. Marie, that the word Bawat thing literally means rapids. So they literally translated and used our word translated into French, but we would just say Sault Ste. Marie, but not know that it's a French word, a French phrasing of its St. Mary's rapids. And so there are so many ways in which the language within the geography communicates so much of that environment that we are in and, and, and such. But we understand so much more about the people when we understand the geography and their relationship 
to that geography as they look up among the stars and see these different constellations. And so as I finish and wrap up before we have questions at the end of my presentation, is I want to speak specifically to Ojik. As we see near the center and the Big Dipper, the constellation that you know of as the Great Bear, we know of as Ojik, the Martin. And the story that he plays in our creation story, within our evolution story, within our existence, within the land that we are in. And it was at a time when there was a forever winter, a time when when all the animals were were huddling around and, and, and shivering and they were wishing and, and, and wanting the spring to return. And it was a time when winter would not go away. And it was because this great hunter, this great ogre had captured all the birds before the season had ended in the fall. Before they migrated south, he captured them all and he prevented them from being released. And that is why this great winter continued and stayed upon us. All the animals that stayed behind were beginning to get hungry, getting to get cold, and were beginning to worry and, and wonder what could they do? What could they do? And they gathered as this great council and they asked among each other, what should we do? And it was one of the wise ones of the, of, of the animals that, 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 that Hmong said, then we must, we must go inside that ogre's den. We must retrieve those birds and release them into the sky. But who among us is going to be brave enough? Brave enough? Who among us is going to be sly and, 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 and sneak into that den and be strong enough and fast enough to avoid being captured by that ogre? And it was only with the encouragement of, of some of the animals that they turned to the, to the Ojig and said, you are a great hunter. You are a fierce fighter. You are sly within the forest. You, will you please sacrifice this time and assist us in helping the return of spring by capturing those birds and releasing them in the sky. With reluctance, he accepted their request. He slowly proceeded and, and, and journeyed towards the hunter's den. He snuck in through the back door as the ogre was exiting through the front door. He got inside there and saw this great bag full of these birds. He gathered that bag and he peeked out the door to make sure that the ogre was far enough away. And as he fled from this great lodge, carrying this large bag with all these birds in it, the weight of it slowed him down and began to make noise as the birds were starting to wonder what was going on and scared within the bag. It startled the hunter. He turned and saw the great, wonderful Ojig chasing, chasing, chasing the hunter did. He chased after that Ojig. He pursued with him and flung arrows at him. And it was that, that journey and that pursuit that he had up, up a hill, up a tall tree. And that, that Ojig jumped high into the sky and that frozen sky, he pounded hard, pounded and pounded hard in, our, in order to break open the sky to release the birds. And just as he released the birds, the ogre slung a new arrow and it pierced him in the tail. And the bend that is in the handle of the Big Dipper we see where that ogre had pierced that ojig with the arrow and he fell back to the earth and all the animals gathered and, and, and nurtured him and saved him. But they pleaded with the creator to honor that ojig for the sacrifice that he had done to return that great spring, to bring back that spring and, and, to, and for the release of all those birds and the sacrifice that he had done to risk his life to do so. So the creator, honors him with this great constellation of the Great Dipper. The Big Dipper is the Ojig, the Martin. And as I end with my presentation, I have a question. What was that great forever winter? Thank you. You're rich. Thank you very much, Phil. And I think, you know, I will go ahead and just say um, all of you listening should definitely look that up um, because this has been, a, that, that's a really good uh, point of trivia. So I'm not going to give away the answer. This has been an amazing talk, leaving us thinking about, you know, our location and the stars and the early universe and the solar system. And of course, the knowledge preserved here. Um, and, you know, it's worth noting that today we have problems reading even magnetic tapes from 100 years ago. Um, um, but the stories here that you've heard are just a, a few and they go back, you know, 
as mentioned, possibly thousands of years. So I'd like to, or tens of thousands of years. So thank you very much, Will. Um, you've given us a, quite a bit of vocabulary. So, um, you know, any uh, linguistic fans in the audience will have had a really good time. I do recall we had key for earth and uh, Mishki key for medicine. So I'm trying my best to learn along with you. Uh, we do have a few questions coming your way. I'm not sure if we'll have time to take all of them, okay. but we're gonna try for a few minutes worth. Um, so let's go ahead and try to get up our first set of questions. So the first question was a little bit of a comment, actually. Okay. Um, and this comment comes from uh, Eric Briggs. Um, okay. The Serpent Mount in Ohio in yes. the previous slide, yes. uh, or the earlier slide, um, that's within the Serpent Mound impact structure, which is several hundred million years old as a... We, oh, okay, okay. Give me a second there. I apologize. I, I figured uh, the... Um... We'll just take a short break here then, yeah. <laughs> I think. Uh, so we're just, uh, we'll just take a short break for a small technical difficulty, okay. but we should be back so, any second now. All right, so my, Are we my, good? Are we good now? Okay, so people Excellent. can see me. There we go. There we go. Okay, so the 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 serpent mound itself, and that's where one of the things that we have to understand is throughout the Americas, the serpent itself represents many things, but similar things, and you can see them identified in pictographs all over the Americas, and and it's no coincidence that if you looked at the pattern in that mound in Ohio, that I could visually point out, like I, I do on my fingers here, that we would see the the shape within. And we would see a pattern of seven and 13. We would see the bends in the pattern of the serpent relating to our symbols and patterns within our teachings of the importance of, uh, as for the Ojibwe, the seven grandfather teachings or the 13 moon teachings and so forth. And so the connection is, is that those natural forms were also natural pattern teachers within our traditions. Wonderful. And uh, we do have a second question also from, from Eric, so we'll go see if we can do it quickly. Okay. Um, asking about the books like The Golden Bough, um, sort of jumbled up a lot of First Nation stories and uh, facilitated a lot of cultural appropriation. Um, is there still any value in those old, uh, in those old books? Or would you, uh, maybe as a second backup, do you have references that you might recommend um, yeah. as a book references? Yeah, if you if you type in native sky watchers, just that as a, as a simple quick search, you will find a lot of other current stories specifically to stars. But bringing it back to one of the things that I, I, I echo is, is that if I were to go and talk to somebody who was French and they were trying to tell me a joke and they tried to translate it into English and they're talking to their friends that are French, they would say to each other, uh, I can't translate it. It's it just it doesn't translate the same way into English. And and when we say that, it's also in that that incultural knowing is, is that when an elder comes, you know, you know, you know what I mean, eh? you know what I mean? The elder is not the know it all that they are hoping that the people in the audience are carrying some of that knowledge. So when Westerners came and captured these stories, the elders were telling the non indigenous story capturers thinking the non-Indigenous capturers or, or ethnographers and, and, and anthropologists actually knew some of the stuff. But what they were getting is an elder who would only tell you part of the story and you needed to fill in the other half. And because they didn't have the other half, much, much of what was recorded was actually only part of the story. And other teachings is that the elder was actually telling the story and that the lesson that was needed and the subjects within it were the actual ethnographers or the, the, the non-Indigenous peoples. So the stories were less about Indigenous peoples, but more about lessons that non-Indigenous peoples needed to hear. So that's where the irony is. So it's almost like you need a translator for the translator uh, in order to better understand some of the material that was uh, appropriated, because you have to put it into context. And some of that context is the geography. You don't take a West Coast cultural story to tell an East Coast cultural reality. And that's what we need to understand, that it's not a Pan-American. You need to understand the geography, the story, the teaching, and those who were present when the story was told. Then you would know what the teaching is. 
Excellent. That is a wonderful resource to recommend as well. Maybe we'll try to get it uh, put into the into the chat as a link. Um, now we have a time for maybe just one or two really, really quick ones. Okay, <laughs> I'm looking at the times uh, nicely here. Um, but th there's a great question from Betty that I just wanted to give you here. It's, it's clear that Indigenous people have a powerful spiritual connection to land and the sky. Um, in today's society, is it hard to keep that connection? It is when um, we see so many people caught up in what is current, what is popular, what is fancy, what is uh, exciting. And, and it's only when we, we disconnect from um, um, the things that really are not as important. When you, when you uh, are experiencing uh, a life-changing event, when you're going through a trauma. And, and I'll tell you, some of the most humblest people in the world are individuals with a disability or people who care for people with disability because they begin to realize what's really important. And watching the Kardashian Kardashians is not one of them. And that's what I'm getting at is, is that that the importance of spirituality comes to us as human beings when we begin to understand what really is important. And right now, globally, the earth is important. And that's why indigenous knowledge, not just Native American indigenous knowledge, but indigenous knowledge from across all cultures all over the planet that have ways of understanding and their ways of understanding include a spirituality. And you need to have that as a balanced way. So the key is, is that when we all wake up to being aware of what's important, we will find that connection and it will become spiritual. Wonderful. And I don't think we have time for any more questions tonight because we are going to have to wrap up soon. There's a few more in chat. So I'll just say as a final wrap up, are there any other resources that you would like people to use um, if they're looking about uh, Indigenous astronomy in Canada or perhaps looking for additional stories for sky phenomena like aurora, a meteors, um, any, anything else that you would like to recommend to our audience before we wrap up? Yeah, we have a Cree elder, uh, um, his name is Wilford Buck. He's uh, from uh, um, Northern um, uh, Manitoba um, in Saskatchewan area. And he's a phenomenal Wilford Buck. Just if you type in Wilford Buck, he's been featured on a number of different uh, um, um, uh, star teachings. He's uh, an astronomer um, and an indigenous of Cree knowledge uh, and speaker and, and is an amazing individual. And so those are just two locations or two individuals, uh, Native Sky Watchers as well as Wilford Buck. But uh, through those sites, you will find a lot of additional sources and resources that will guide you to other materials, but a lot of it is Indigenous stars, but not just the North American Indigenous, because the work that we've done with Native Sky Watchers is actually, um, uh, Annette Lee has done so much work and with the support of NASA to bring in Indigenous peoples from all cultures across the world from Africa to Asia, to the Middle East, to South America, to uh, the Polynesian, uh, to Chinese. So it's just phenomenal um, that as a resource. So Native Sky Watchers um, and, and the other is Wilfred Buck as a, as a Canadian who will uh, definitely blow your mind. You can look for videos on Google of, of the stuff that he does and what he speaks about. So that's two that will definitely fill you up and through them uh, you could find other resources. Wonderful. Well, thank you once again, Will. Uh, we could certainly stay here chatting quite a while about this, but we have to stop and uh, wrap up for tonight. So thank you once again. And with that, I would like to take the opportunity to hand over to the president of the Toronto Centre, RASC, Tom Luton, to finish off the evening. Can you hear me now? Okay, awesome. Well, good evening, everybody. So, uh, quick announcements tonight. So, as Elena was saying earlier, we've got two types of meetings going on. We've got our recreational astronomy nights, and we have our speakers nights. Uh, both of them are live here on YouTube. So, um, and we then love for you folks to come by and watch them live or you can watch them later on if you do see them live please say hello in the chat uh please enter some questions for the presenters as others have done if you're a new member please introduce yourself and if you're visiting us from far far away please let us know where you're from 
So our next Recreational Astronomy Night is on the 1st of December. Andy Beaton will be handling the sky this month. Uh, Reza Mohammed will be discussing how I stack and process my astro images. And we still have one open presentation slot. So if you've got an idea of something you'd like to present, please drop a line to Paul Markov. Now there's no speakers night meeting in December due to the holiday season. Our next speakers night is going to be in January and details will follow. Uh, coming up to DDO uh, in the next couple weeks, this Saturday at 7.30 p.m. Uh, online is our very own Dr. Roberto, Roberto Abraham discussing cool stuff we discovered with Dragonfly, the Many Lens Telescope. Uh, you have to register online. It's a $12.50 fee. Uh, next weekend, on November the 28th at 12.30 p.m., Sunday Stargazing. Uh, it's six seventy eight dollar six seventy eight uh, registration fee. Register online. Links are at rasto.ca. Now, um, this is both some sad news and some good news. You'll recall that our good friend and longtime Toronto Centre member Peter Hiscox passed away in the summer of August of 2018. And the reason I bring this up is that last week. The Minor Planet Center announced that uh, in honor of Peter's long work with the RASC and with uh, light pollution abatement, asteroid 10073 has been named Peter Hiscox in his honor. Uh, originally asteroid 1989 GJ2, discovered in April of 1989 by E.W. Elst at the European Southern Observatory. Uh, the official blurb put out by the MPC uh, is that Peter Hiscox, 1945 to 2018, was professor of electrical engineering at Ryerson University in Toronto and an expert on illumination engineering. He was an amateur astronomer recognized for his advocacy of light pollution abatement and was chair of the Light Pollution Abatement Committee of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, Toronto Centre. Uh, a few additional pieces of information about this asteroid. Um, it's a main belt asteroid uh, with a 3.63 year orbit. Uh, its distance from the sun varies from 2.1 to 2.63 astronomical units. And its brightness puts it into between about 16th and 19th magnitudes. So unfortunately, it's a little too faint for most of our astronomical gear to see it. You're going to have to use some fairly significant uh, horsepower to get a look at this. Um, so uh, fingers crossed that in the future, we in the Toronto Center will have a chance to do an asteroid occultation involving this asteroid and uh, get add a little more information uh, to the record for asteroid 10073 Peter Hiscox. And speaking of observing, uh, this is where I get to plug our observing certificates program. If you've been busy over the last few months uh, looking up at the sky, and are you almost done with your certificates? If so, let us know. And so we can get you the paperwork certificate and the nice shiny pin, examples of which are here on the side. Uh, some of our certificates are Explore the Moon, Explore the Universe, Messier Catalog, the finest new general catalog, of objects, double stars, the Isabel Williamson lunar certificate, deep sky gems, and deep sky challenge objects. More details at rask.ca slash certificate dash programs. Education Public Outreach continues uh, their work online uh, and also with virtual star parties at the Science Center, Millennium Square, David Dunham Observatory, the St. Clair O'Connor Community with the Dunlap Institute, and with Brownies, Cubs, Scouts, and school groups. Um, if you would like them to do an event with you, please contact public education at rasto.ca. Our observing sessions are still suspended until further notice as a result of the pandemic at Victoria, at Baby Village Park, at the Long Sioux Conservation Area, and at the Ontario Science Center. The CAO is open for bookings. However, it started to snow. So that means that the road, uh, if it isn't closed, it's going to close fairly soon. 
Um, uh, site occupancy is currently limited to 10 bookings up to 25 individuals. One uh, person upstairs in the house and the rest uh, involved in day use or not staying or, or independent camping using RVs. The Sioux Laura Observatory is open. The Jeff Brown Observatory is still closed. Full details are on the website. Please read everything before making your booking. This is where I get to plug RASC membership. Uh, if you're joining us as a guest, um, have you ever thought about becoming a member? Uh, you can join or renew online at secure.rask.ca. Uh, if the COVID pandemic has thrown your finances for a loop, the RASC does have an emergency fund. Uh, and uh, the holiday season coming up, we also sell gift memberships. Details for both can be found by contacting mempub at rask.ca. Now, tonight is our annual meeting. Um, it will begin in approximately 10 minutes after the end of our session here on YouTube. Registered participants have received their Zoom links already. Uh, just a reminder that we need 25 members to conduct business. And so if you signed up to attend, please do so. And for everyone else, I'd like to thank you for joining us. Uh, please follow us on all the various forms of social media. If you liked what you saw, uh, please like and subscribe and click the notification bell. Have yourself a good evening and uh, keep safe and keep looking up. Good night, everybody.